Well, hello, everyone. It's Dr. Phil. You're back to fill in the blanks, and we are moving on from narcissism. We are in the Toxic Personalities in the Real World series, and I'm really wanting to have a conversation with you. I'm not wanting to talk at you. I'm not wanting to do a presentation so much as I guess I'm wanting to kind of be, I guess, your friend at the factory, I suppose in just talking to you about some of the people that you encounter in your lives and give you some insight and understanding as to who these people are, what impact they can have in your life, and what you can do about it. Now, we've talked about narcissism and the different types of narcissists, and I want to move on now to something known as the borderline personality disorder. Now, borderline personality is, I don't know that it's really all that descriptive. And you guys know I'm not really big about labels. But I'm going to defend labeling for a little while here to tell you this. Labels are used a lot for insurance purposes. You've heard me say that. But it's also important in communicating to a therapist, for example, as to what they're treating. That really gets important here in borderline personality, and I'll tell you why in just a little while. Labels are a shorthand that therapists can use to communicate with one another or to a hospital or to a caregiver down the road somewhere if they can use that shorthand to describe to a future caregiver or a new caregiver what this person's history has included, what their symptom cluster is by giving them this descriptor. And here's what borderline personality disorder describes. A pervasive pattern of instability of interpersonal relationships, self-image and affects, and marked impulsivity, beginning at least by early adulthood, and present in a variety of contexts. Now, let's break that down a minute, because that's a pretty busy sentence, and I really want you to understand and make sense of these because they play a part of your role. A pervasive pattern of instability. Okay, now that means that this isn't just somebody that has a bad day, or they have a bad week, or things have gone poorly at work, or whatever. This is a pervasive pattern. That means It's going to be there with this person week in and week out, month in and month out. It pervades their life. If you were going to describe them across time, you would say there is a pattern of instability. They're unstable. And where? Well, in interpersonal relationships, they're just not stable in those. We're going to talk about what that means, but think about it in just common sense terms instability in interpersonal relationships. What's that mean? Well, they run hot, they run cold, they're happy, then they're sad, then they're mad, then they're glad. They just up and down, up and down, emotional roller coaster in their interpersonal relationships. And this isn't just intimate relationships, romantic relationships. It can be everything. It can be with their brother or their sister, their mother or their father, their lovers, their coworkers, anyone that they have a relationship with it can be marked by instability, up and down, up and down. Instability in their self-image. These people oftentimes don't know who they are. They'll question, I I don't really know who I am anymore. You'll hear them say things like that. You'll hear them put their head in their hands and say, I don't even know who I am anymore. I, I I just don't know. One day they'll be up and they'll be thumping their chest and full of vim and vigor and confidence. And the next day, they're like wondering why they're even in this world. And then affect, that means emotions and the way it expresses itself. There's instability in their emotions. Within one hour, they can be laughing and crying and raging. Instability of emotion. Then marked impulsivity. These people don't think things through. They're very impulsive. They take high-risk behaviors. 
They act on impulse. They don't think it through. They just pull the trigger. They just go. They have an idea and boom, they're on it. Now, this starts by early adulthood. So that means you'll see this early in their life. You may see it when they're teenagers. You might even see it real early on. And when we say it's present in a variety of contexts, that means it's not situation specific. It's not just that they do this in reaction to their parents, or they do it only at school, or they do it only when they're around their brother. That means it happens in a variety of contexts. It cuts across environments. You'll see this in their work relationships. You'll see it at church. You'll see it at their family reunions. You'll see it in their own family with their husband or their wife. So that's what we've got. Let's think about it again. A pervasive pattern of instability. That's the core of this. Instability and impulsivity. That's the core of the borderline personality disorder. Instability, up and down, up and down, and impulsivity. And it can be intrapersonal, meaning it's all about them, or it can be interpersonal, it's between them and someone else. And we're going to get into more detail, but that's what we're talking about. So if you've got people in your life that are just really volatile, they're just really up and down, then we're headed in this direction. Now, do they fit the diagnosis? Maybe, maybe not, but that's not important. It's important that you understand that there are people that have these symptoms, these traits, these characteristics, and if they cluster together and they are pervasive, meaning they're around a lot, then this is what you might be dealing with, and we're going to talk about strategies for handling that. Now, how often does this occur? Well, these kinds of things are often way underdiagnosed because these people don't often present for treatment. It's not like a broken leg where you can't walk on it, so you got to go get help. But estimates are that there are at least 18 million people in the world that have this pattern of behaviors. 18 million people. That's quite a lot. Now, Dr. Linehan is a real expert in borderline personalities. And I don't consider myself to be a vertically developed expert in borderline personality. And what I mean by vertically developed is there are some people within a profession like psychology who devote their entire career to one disorder or one group of people. And so that's all they do. They do research about that. They develop treatments about that. They work only with that population. That's what we mean by vertically developed. doesn't mean they don't know other things, but thank God we have people that devote so much of their time, effort, energy, and career to a particular group of people or particular diagnosis. And Dr. Linehan is a real expert when it comes to borderline personality. And she makes this observation. She says borderline personality disorder is by far the most stigmatized disorder of all. In fact, she says if you wind up in the emergency room for any reason, do not tell them that you have been diagnosed with borderline personality disorder because they're going to go, oh, okay, we've got a nutball here. We don't want to deal with this person. They're going to be more trouble than they're worth, so let's just not deal with them. Big stigma associated with borderline personality disorder. Let me tell you why I want to say that. Think about what we've just described. These people have a high degree of instability, a high degree of impulsivity, problems with their self-image, and they're emotionally very volatile. What do you think it must be like for those people? Now, I know what they're like to live with. <laughs> they can be a real pain. But think about what it must be like for them. This is not fun for these people. They don't do this because it's cool. They don't do it to entertain themselves. So 
I'm saying that if you have someone in your life like this, try to have some compassion. Try to approach these people with a degree of understanding because this is not fun for them. They don't like this. Now, a lot of personality disorders, they tend to think, hey, this is working for me, so I, you know, why would I fix what ain't broke? They don't see the downside to it. However, a lot of personality disorders create a lot of pain for the person, and I think borderline personality is one of those disorders. I think these people experience a lot of pain, a lot of anguish, a lot of real discomfort in their lives. And as I get into the nine traits, characteristics, or symptoms of the borderline personality, you're going to understand what I mean about that. If you look at most of the people that write about this, and I'm not just talking about the DSM, which is the Diagnostic and Statistic Manual of the American Psychiatric Association, but most people that work with borderline personalities, most people that have experience with them, they'll tell you, if they were just going to describe them, not in big words, but just, you know, here's my experience of them, they would tell you that there's instability in their relationships, that they can't get a good relationship to stick, that they're real volatile in their moods, they have problems modulating their behavior, they have issues with their identity or their sense of self, and they have a profound fear of abandonment. They just have a chronic fear of being left. And they have a huge reaction. They're hyper-reactive to almost anything that triggers one of these areas. Now, you may be thinking, wow, you know, when Dr. Phil was talking about narcissism, he cautioned us about kind of absorbing all of the descriptors and thinking that we're that way. Remember I talked about being a freshman in college and going through Psychology 101 and every disorder you studied about, you thought, oh my gosh, that's me. Every disease that you talked about in biology was like, oh my God, I've got it. We're all pretty suggestible when we're learning about something kind of new and scary. Look, we all have insecurities. So when you talk about instability and relationship and mood, you're going, well, look, I'm not just totally secure. I have insecurities. Am I borderline? We're talking about a matter of degree. You remember me telling you that all behavior is on a continuum? Well, that's true. And of course we all have some insecurities. But if somebody leaves us, if we're in a relationship and we break up, even if we get a divorce, most of us know we'll be okay. I'm not saying it's not going to hurt, because it does, and we may cry for a while. We may even be really down in the dumps, even for a matter of weeks or a month or something. But in our heart of hearts, we know we'll be okay. But a borderline personality it's life or death. It's life or death. We may want somebody to be in our lives, but we don't need them to be in our lives. It might be good if they were, but we don't have to have them to survive, and we know that. Borderline personality disorders are so hyperreactive and so dramatic that they just feel like, oh my God, if I don't have them, I'll just die here. I can't make it. So what's unique about this personality disorder out of all of the others? There are 10 personality disorders described in the DSM, the Diagnostic and Statistic Manual. There's three clusters, but there are 10 personality disorders. And what's unique about the borderline personality is how unstable these people are and how vast the changes are that they can have within an hour. A lot of people might say, wow, 
this volatility up and then way down in the dumps, that sounds like bipolar. No. Sometimes if you don't really do your homework with a client, you might misdiagnose this. And again, that's why I say the label I'm going to defend here, because if you misdiagnose a borderline personality disorder as bipolar, then you're going to treat bipolar and not borderline personality, and that would be a real problem. And how do you distinguish between the two? A borderline personality disorder is going to have mania that lasts for days and days, maybe even longer. And by that, I mean they're going to be manic in the sense that they might be out spending money they don't have. They might become promiscuous. They may be doing high-risk behaviors. They may think they can undertake any task and get it done. They think they can paint the whole house over the weekend, and there's no way they can do that. They might go out and buy three cars that they can't afford. I mean, they're just manic. They're just they're just everywhere, everywhere, everywhere. The difference with the borderline personality is that'll all happen within an hour. They'll be up within an hour and then down within an hour and then rage within an hour. Whereas with bipolar disorder, that's going to last for days or maybe even a couple of weeks. So what makes this disorder so unique is this changeability occurs so rapidly. Now think about people in your life. Do you have somebody in your life that you're going, oh my God, where did that come from? What in the hell triggered that? We were just getting along great. We were happy. You know, we were driving to the mountains here, and 20 minutes ago we were happy and laughing, and now you're over there crying and upset and accusing me of leaving you? What, what the hell happened? I didn't even say anything. And you're personalizing it, saying, what did I do? Nothing. <laughs> you didn't do anything. You could trigger your partner because you're wearing a plaid shirt or a red blouse. Or you could trigger them because you're not wearing a red blouse. It doesn't have anything to do with you. This comes from the inside out. So if you're in a relationship with somebody and you've been racking your brain saying, what the hell? We seem to be doing this fine, and then all of a sudden, boom. They just do a 180 on me. You could very well be dealing with a borderline personality. And I want you to know that so you can go, okay, I get it. It isn't just me. I'm not alone here. This happens. There are 18 million people in the world that do this. And yes, I'm asking you to have compassion for these people. Because as frustrating as they are for you, as much as they drive you to the end, as much as they get on your, quote, last nerve, as my grandmother used to say, it's miserable for them. Think how they must feel with this going on. And one thing you need to be aware of is you could be dealing with somebody that has both borderline personality disorder, and bipolar. They might have this very unique volatility that happens really fast within an hour or a day. And they might also be bipolar, where they have this mania that stretches out across days, followed by a period of depression. And that makes it really difficult, both to diagnose if you're a caregiver or living with someone like that. So borderline personality is often coexisting with other disorders like anxiety or depression or bipolar. So these people can present real problems for you to deal with. But there are nine characteristics 
that kind of identify these people. And you can call them characteristics, traits, symptoms, whatever you want to call them. But there are nine descriptors that are at the heart of the borderline personality disorder. Now, you don't have to have all nine to get this diagnosis. You just have to have five out of the nine. Just five out of the nine. But I'm going to tell you about all nine. Number one, fear of abandonment. Either real or imagined, these people have fear of abandonment. They're going to overreact to anything that they believe to be a threat to you leaving them. And therefore, they're going to make frantic efforts to avoid you leaving them. Now, what is it that can set off this fear of abandonment? It can be anything innocuous. You can get caught in traffic on the way home. So you arrive home 15 minutes late. And that triggers them into you don't want to be with them. You're going to leave them. You can talk about you're going to go away for the weekend with your girlfriends or the fishing buddies, or you want to go out for the evening. You're going to go to your child's volleyball game. And so you're not going to be there for dinner. They can be threatened by you being with your own child. Like, you don't want to be with me. You're abandoning me. This is what it looks like you leaving me. I get it now. This is what you leaving me looks like. They will take that and twist it into you abandoning them. Let's say you have a friend, and you make dinner plans for the weekend, and your mom calls, and she's ill. And she's not dying, but she's ill, and she says, you know, could you come over and kind of help out a little bit, because I don't really feel like getting up and cooking anything, and I'm starving, and i just be nice you came over and helped me out a little bit. So you call your friend, and you say, boy, my mom is really under the weather, it's not a huge deal, but it's just a cold, and I think I'm going to have to cancel dinner and go be with my mom. Oh, my God. If you're talking to a borderline personality, they can take that. It's like, oh, okay, I get it. I get it. So this is, this is the beginning of the end right here. You don't want to have anything to do with me anymore. They will take that and overreact to it, overinterpret it. That's what I mean real or imagined. They'll take that and turn it and be so threatened by it that they will wear you absolutely out. They'll wear you absolutely out. Now, how's that going to show? They're going to make frantic efforts to keep you close. They're going to beg. They're going to cling. They're going to start fights because they want to engage you. And any kind of attention is better than no attention at all. They're going to track your movements. They may physically block you from leaving. Like you may say, I'm going to go over and see my brother. And they actually block the door. You're not leaving me. Whoa, whoa. No, what, what do you mean I'm not leaving you? I'm just going over to see my brother. Now, all of this overreactive behavior You've all heard the old saw, what I fear I create. Unfortunately, this hyperreactive behavior, this clinginess, this demanding, this begging, this frantic hanging on, often has the opposite effect of driving the person away. So they do create what they fear. And this can happen in all relationships. It can happen at work. It can happen with intimate relationships. Number two is the pattern of unstable relationships. Now, you heard me say this before, intense and short-lived. These people have a lot of relationships because when they get in them, boy, they are all in. They fall in love right away. They want to be your best friend right away. They want to spend all of their time with you right away. They wanted to consume you right away. They want to be your focus of attention right away. So they fall in love real quick. Each person is the one. Oh, I I've, I've met the one last night. Oh, she is it. She is the one. He is the one. The one that will make you feel whole. 
only to be quickly disappointed because nobody is going to be able to meet all of their needs because they can't be met. So they're going to be quickly disappointed. They live in the extremes. And when people live in the extremes, they make wild swings. So they're either perfect or horrible. That person is either up on a pedestal or they're down in the dumps. And trust me, a borderline personality, when they get in, they're going to love bomb you. They're going to put you up on a pedestal. They're going to worship you. And trust me, that is a long way to fall and fall you will. Because very soon they're going to decide you are abandoning them because number one was fear of abandonment. They're going to put you on a pedestal. They're going to worship you. You're going to be the answer to all their needs, all their problems. Finally, they've met their Savior. And the first time you're five minutes late, off that pedestal you come tumbling. How could you do this to me? How could you let me down this way? How could you betray me and mislead me this way? You made me love you. You made me believe in you. And now you do this to me. Lovers, friends, family members, they're going to feel like they're on an emotional roller coaster with these people. Rapid mood swings from idealization to devaluation, anger, and then it's hate. Remember I said in the extremes, all the way out here, they love you. All the way back here, they, oh my God, they hate you. It isn't like they love you and then decide, well, okay, you weren't the one, so we'll just be friends. No, 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 no. No, these people live in the extremes. This isn't like, okay, now we'll just be friends. They just don't have just friends. Everything is in the extreme. Number three, identity disturbance. Look, these people are very unclear about their self-image because it's shifting all the time. It's unstable. Their sense of self flip-flops. They may feel good about themselves one minute and hate themselves the next. And it's so much so that it may lead to self-harm. They don't have a clear idea of who they are or what they want. And they may frequently change roles. They may change jobs, friends, lovers, religions, values, goals. And you'll see them change their look. They'll change their fashion. They'll change their hair. They may even change their name. They'll show up and say, call me Carol today. What? <laughs> I thought your name was Diane. Well, I'm going by Carol now. Oh, really? <laughs> but it says here on your name tag, you're Diane. I know, but I, just call me Carol. I'm going by Carol now. I'm just, I'm, I'm changing. They may change the group they affiliate with. They may even change their sexual identity. Now, this is not dissociative identity disorder, or what a lot of people call split personality. It's not that they have some alter personality, because they're not even stable in what they're switching to. It's kind of like we say in Texas, if you don't like the weather, wait a minute, because <laughs> it changes real fast. It might be bright and sunny one minute and hailing the next and freezing the next. I mean, things change, and that's the way they are. They have an unstable image of themselves. So there's an identity disturbance. They're not clear on who they are. Think about that. Are you clear on who you are? Do you know who you are? Do you know what your values are, what you believe, what your standards are, what you will do and what you won't do, what you like and what you don't like? Sometimes borderline personalities believe what the last group of people they were believed. If they hang out with people smoking dope, now okay, now they're dope smokers. If they hang out with people that were kind of really religious zealots, okay, now they're religious zealots. If they hang out with people that are really big into working out, now they're big workouters. They don't know who they are, so they're kind of anybody's dog that'll hunt with them. It's whatever identity they can latch on to because they're looking for somewhere to belong. Number four, impulsivity. 
These are people that do a lot of self-destructive behaviors. They take high-risk behaviors, especially when they're upset. If they are emotionally upset, they're likely to do a lot of really impulsive and potentially hurtful behavior. Spend money they can't afford, binge eat, drive recklessly, shoplift, be promiscuous. They might overdo it with drugs or alcohol because what they're looking for is to feel good in the moment. They don't use a lot of foresight to think about, okay, now wait a minute. Is this really in my best interest? How do they know? Because they don't even know who they are. They've got this identity disturbance. But they can hurt you and everybody around them over the long term. They might gamble away their entire paycheck in a night because they're impulsive. Now, these people also have a recurrent tendency to self-harm. This can mean cutting, burning, suicidal ideation, suicidal gestures, even suicidal attempts. That's because they're so frustrated because they don't know where they fit. They don't know where they belong. They feel alienated from the world. It's kind of an existential crisis with them all the time because they don't know where they belong. Now, I talked about instability of relationships. Now I want to talk about extreme emotional instability. That's number six. One moment they may feel happy, the next despondent, and then rage. And little things send them into a tailspin. And when I say tailspin, I'm talking about intense When they have an emotional switch, it goes to the extreme. Remember I said they live in the extremes. They love you or hate you. You're wonderful or horrible. And that's it with the emotional instability. Little things can put them into an emotional tailspin. Up and down is really what they experience. Versus depression or mania from bipolar. This can happen in just minutes or hours. Because of this instability, they're going to overreact, and everything is going to be very dramatic. There's hyperreactivity. You might say something that hurts their feelings, and oh my gosh. They don't just get their feelings hurt. They are wounded. It's the worst thing they've ever heard. Can't believe you said that to me. They're crushed. Number seven, chronic feelings of emptiness. These are people that are marked by a feeling of a big void in their life. And you'll hear them talk about it. You'll hear them talk about, oh my God. It's as if they're nothing or nobody. They just don't know what's the point. Why am I even doing this? And they might try to fill that void with things like drugs or food or sex, just anything. They're looking for anything that makes them feel not so empty. And of course, nothing works because that's not the issue. The issue is that's how they feel. It's not what is, it's how they feel. Now, here's one of the big problems. Number eight, explosive anger. And they have real trouble controlling it once that fuse is lit. Focus on the word explosive anger. Look, everybody gets upset. Everybody gets angry. You know, they get a little mad at the partner or a friend. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about explosive anger. You can be walking down the mall because you're headed to a movie with your friend who's a borderline personality, and boom, it is like a bomb went off. You might say something, you might not have said something, and they start yelling, throwing things, or becoming completely consumed by rage, where they don't even know 
what they're doing. And this might be directed towards you or someone else in their life, or it could be directed inward. Sometimes that rage is towards themselves. But the borderline personality disorder is marked by explosive rage. Explosive rage. Now, number nine, and this is one of those really busy sentences, so I'm going to break this down, but I'm taking this kind of out of the DSM. Transient, stress-related paranoid ideation or severe dissociative symptoms, suspicious or out of touch with reality, paranoid or suspicious thoughts about others' motives. When under stress, they may even lose touch with reality or have an experience known as dissociation. They might report feeling foggy, spaced out, or as if they're outside of their own body. Now, let's break this down for a second. First off, this is transient. That means it doesn't last. It just comes and goes. It usually is brought on by stress, meaning something's going on in their life. Maybe their partner's breaking up with them. Maybe they're under a lot of pressure at work to meet a criteria or some quota. And so they start having paranoid ideation like the world's out to get them. They're under stress, and they think the world's out to get them. And so when I say they have severe dissociative symptoms, what I mean is they start to lose touch with that reality. It's so stressful, they can't deal with it, so they start kind of splitting off. It's like the Scarlett O'Hara school of thought. I don't want to think about that today. I think I'll think about that tomorrow. It's just too much. They can't deal with it. So they start to dissociate from the situation. They're very suspicious at this point. Why do you want to know something? Why are you trying to help me? What do you really want? They're going to be suspicious. And they're out of touch with reality. They don't realize, wait a minute, I've been your friend for a year and a half. Why all of a sudden am I the enemy? Well, because they're out of touch with reality, they're out of touch with your motives. It doesn't matter that you've been their friend for a year and a half. They're out of touch with that right now. And when they're under stress, they may lose touch with reality completely for a few minutes. I mean, it's transient, but they may completely dissociate and feel foggy and spaced out and even as though they're outside their own body. So... You might look and say, they've gone psychotic. They don't even know where they are. They're, like, not even here. No, they really haven't gone psychotic. It's just the stress has gotten so much that they've gone Scarlet O'Hare on you. They said, I can't deal with this, so I'm just going to space out. And they just go another place in their mind. Now, You only need five of these nine to be considered borderline personality disorder. Fear of abandonment is going to be really common. Impulsivity is going to be really common. Rapid mood swings is going to be really common. Inappropriate anger and difficulty with relationships. Unstable self-image, intense emotions. Those are the ones you're going to see the most. But any of the five, you could be diagnosed that way. Now, a gentleman by the name of Theodore Milan, if you're really, really interested, you might want to read a book he wrote called Disorders of Personality, DSM-5 and Beyond. Now, he wrote this, oh gosh, mid-90s, probably 95. And 
while they're not listed in the DSM, he actually worked with people putting the DSM together. And he said there were four subtypes. One was discouraged or quiet. These are real clingy, passive, borderline personality types, and they're real prone to self-mutilation, suicide, feelings of emptiness. They have an intolerance of being alone. So they're clingy and passive, and they may cut or burn themselves a lot. And then there's the impulsive type. These are the energetic, charismatic types. I mean, they come on really strong, but they can just as quickly become cold and hostile. They're easily bored, so they start taking high-risk behaviors, and they're prone to self-mutilation, suicide. They're very resistant to treatment. And then there's the petulant. They're angry. They feel unworthy. They're very possessive. They don't let you out of their sight. This is where you see a lot of eating disorders, a lot of drug addiction. And then there's just the straight-up self-destructive. These people are marked by bitterness, self-hatred. I mean, they just really turn this anger inward. And the self-hatred can take all kinds of forms. and they're attention seekers. They show off a lot. So you're going to see them reckless driving, maybe get into drugs, promiscuity, eating disorders of some type. If you're thinking about the nine, it only takes five. And then your person that you're thinking about, whether it's yourself or somebody else, you might think further as to whether or not you fit in one of those four categories that are more descriptive, discouraged or quiet, impulsive, petulant, or self-destructive. Now, why do people get this way? Well, I'm sorry to tell you we don't really know. There's probably some kind of biological vulnerability That could be genetic, or it could be some other kind of composition in your biology. And they typically have in their past some kind of invalidating environment. Somewhere along the line, they've been abused, beaten, molested, where who they thought they were or who they wanted to be or become, has been taken away from them. So if you look back into their histories, there is some kind of biological predisposition in some way a lot of the time. But then also, the way they've been raised, the way they've grown up, they've been told, you don't matter. I don't see you. I don't hear you. So they lose their self-image. They lose their self-worth. They have identity disturbance because they've been told they don't matter. They're just not on the priority list. It just doesn't matter. Now, that's pretty vague, but If you've got it in your family, you're at higher risk for having it yourself. And if you've been through an environment that didn't teach you to value yourself, and in fact taught you not to value yourself, then you're probably more likely to experience this than anyone else. So is it treatable? Well, some research says that as high as 84% of the people with borderline personality disorder respond positively to treatment. I'm not saying that they cure it or they completely get over it, but they do respond positively to treatment. So there is hope. And there is a particular treatment that we'll talk about in the future called dialectical behavior therapy. It's an evidence-based therapy that's been shown 
to create good results with these people, more so than a lot of other things. And we'll talk about that in the future. Now, if you're living with one of these people, there are a lot of do's and don'ts. There are a lot of strategies that you can have. And that's what we're going to talk about next time is, okay, if I have spotted one of these people, if you, okay, Dr. Phil, you finally put a name to it. You've identified for me what it is I'm dealing with here. Because I've been wondering, what the hell? This person, it seems like no matter what I do, it just doesn't matter. They just go off. Well, now you may know why. They may be borderline personality. And if that's true, how are you ever going to get them to treatment? Well, let me give you one clue in closing here. You want to talk to people about what they deserve, not what they need. People don't like it when you step up to them and say, you know what you need to do? You need to get some help. You need to go see a therapist. You need to get somebody that will sit down and help you work this out. That sounds very judgmental. And for a borderline personality disorder, it sounds like a way to abandon them. It sounds judgmental, and it's likely to trigger resistance and rage, but it sure as hell sounds like get away from me, you're sick, you're broken, you're wounded. And they're going to turn that into something that plays right into their fear of abandonment, and it's going to further complicate their disrupted identity. If, on the other hand, you approach them by saying, I notice that you're anxious a lot, or I notice that you really seem to be depressed and unhappy. And I just want to tell you, I love you, and I think you deserve to get that out of your life. I think you deserve better than that. And I think you deserve to give yourself whatever it takes for that to not be part of your life anymore. I just know you, and I think you deserve it. So, I mean, let's talk about what can be done. I mean, what do you deserve? Now, does that mean they're going to run and jump into a dialectical behavior therapist arms? Not necessarily, but you're going to have a lot better success talking to them about what they deserve instead of judgmentally telling them what they need. And even if you're not doing it judgmentally, there's a good chance that's how they're going to hear it. So I'm just saying, take out the word need from your vocabulary and put in the word deserve and see if you maybe get less pushback that way. See if you come across less judgmental and less preachy. I don't know. Maybe you will. Maybe it'll be more successful for you. Okay. Now, we've been talking about borderline personality. And as I say, I'm telling you all of this because I want you to recognize what you're dealing with. 50% of the solution to any problem lies in defining it. And I think if you know why you are the way you are or why somebody else is the way they are, it's much easier to deal with it. Maybe I'm describing someone in your life here. Maybe I'm describing you. And if I'm describing you, don't stigmatize yourself. There's nothing to be ashamed of here. I mean, this is a tough situation, and you deserve, I've just told you my strategy, and now I'm doing it with you. You deserve to have some help with it. And, you know, the reason that that works is because it's true. I've been fighting stigma in mental illness for 45 years. I 
absolutely hate that people deny themselves help because there's a stigma attached. If they admit they have a mental illness, if they admit they have a personality disorder or something that needs treatment, it's like they've admitted a flaw, a fallacy, a weakness. Well, we all have flaws, fallacies, and weaknesses, and that's okay. And human beings are supposed to be joyful and rejoice in the Spirit. So when I say I think you deserve to be set free from this, I really mean it. And there's help available, and it does help. You can be helped with this. You can live a happier, more peaceful life. So I'm saying, yeah, you deserve it. And everybody around you deserves it too. They deserve to have all of you instead of just the part that comes through the anxiety. And it helps a lot. Instead of telling somebody, I think you have borderline personality disorder. To just talk about the obvious, if they're depressed or they're anxious, start with that. Let the therapist work it out. If they're good, they'll get to the borderline part. They'll get to that. Just talk to them that they deserve some help with their depression or their anxiety. Something that's comorbid with the borderline personality disorder. Okay, we're going to be talking about that. I know you guys have a lot of questions, and I want to hear them. I hope you're enjoying this series on a toxic personality. I want you to subscribe to the podcast because this is my chance to give you the tools you need to live a better life. We're going to be talking about these toxic personalities, and we're going to be talking about what you can do with your personality to become more effective in your life. I want to be available to you personally. I want to answer the questions that I know you have. And so if you'll let me know what they are, I will address them. Whether it's parenting or motivation or how to get ahead or how to manage these people in your life, you write those questions and that will guide what I talk about. I'm just doing this because you guys are asking me to do it. And I'll do it as long as you're asking me to do it. You sent in a lot of questions this last time, and I'm going to get to them next time. Some of your questions, how do I leave somebody with personality disorder? Do people with personality disorder ever apologize? What do people with this disorder not see in themselves that other people can easily see? Do borderline personality people know what they're doing and when they're being mean? All of these things that you're asking, I'm going to answer those things. Send me your other questions. All right. Be sure and subscribe to the podcast and click the notifications bell on there so you'll get a signal whenever I post up something new. Right now, I'm doing it every week, dropping them on Tuesday. I encourage you to listen more than once if you need to. Take some notes, write down some things that are important, and we'll continue. You're pretty much experts on narcissism now. We'll add this, and then we'll keep moving along. I'm Dr. Phil, and I'll see you next time. So long. Be healthy.